Hi, Ellen. Hello. <laughs> How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to this beautiful place to interview. And um, so I wanted to ask you, what kind of art do you do? So I make cyanotypes and they are photographs made without a camera. Um, sometimes people call them blueprints or sunprints. And I combine those with origami, um, textile sometimes. Um, and I make works that are often related to memory, ideas around memory. Okay. And uh, how did you find your way into cyanotype? So, as a teenager, I started with analog photography. I had a black and white camera and I kept taking black and white pictures. Um, as I grew up, and I still take black and white pictures, um, and I used to work in science. Uh, and as a scientist in a laboratory, there's usually a dark room somewhere. So you can always find a space where you can develop your films and print your pictures. Okay, um, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, electron microscopists are the people to know, so they will always have a dark room. So I worked in universities and places like that, and there was always a space. And then uh, I moved to one place in London and there was no dark room. So I still wanted to make things with my hands. I needed to make the photographs myself. I didn't want to go digital. And this was about 20 years ago. And I came across cyanotype technique and I tried it and I've never stopped. I just found it uh, fascinating from the beginning. I think it satisfies my science nerd inside. Um, it's very, uh, very hands-on. It feels like an experiment every time, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's lots of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, why do you keep doing it? Um, it lets me express what I want to express in a picture. Um, it's taken me to places I never thought I could go with, photo with photography. Um, and like I said, it's fun. It's, it's just really engaging. It's, it's, it's easy. Um, you can do it on so many different types of material. Um, yeah, it's very versatile. Yeah, and, and, I, and I love combining it with other things. So when I found that I could make origami with cyanotype mixed together, it changed my work from being 2D to being 3D. And I started being able to make sculptures instead of just flat pictures. Uh, and I started being able to work with new ideas and uh, yeah, it, it just it just changed my whole approach to to art, not just photography, but to art. So, yeah. Great. And uh, <laughs> this is a hard one. Uh, what do you do when you feel stuck? Oh, you have the uh, artist's yeah. block, as yeah, they call it. Artist's block. Well, I tend to. What do I do? I, 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 I read a lot, I think. I like to, yeah, once, once I can, I read a lot. I either read just books that have nothing to do with art or photography, uh, or I, so I read a lot of science fiction, for example, or, or I might go for walks. Um, I will try and think about the ideas, so not think about the end result, yeah. but think about the, the general topic. So I will send emails to the people that I'm collaborating with. So I work a lot with philosophers really? um, and I will write to them about ideas or I'll start reading philosophical papers and try and get some idea and just hope that something appears. I hope that some idea comes, but it's usually, uh, I don't worry about it too much. So I can go a long time between making one thing and making the next thing, and that's okay. I don't have to make something every day. It can be days or weeks and weeks between making one thing and making the next, and then the ideas go round and they go round and they go round, and then, and then I work like really hard and make pictures for 
days at a time. And all these things that have been going around, they come out. And yeah, it's um, so the, the it never feels like a block, it's more like it's part of the process. Uh, yeah, it's more, yeah, it's almost like a washing machine, things are going around and mixing together, and then whatever comes out of the, of the pictures that you make at the end. Mm -hmm. But I do like to get a lot of um, ideas from other places, so um, I, I like to collaborate a lot if possible. I found some of the most interesting things that I've done have been from collaborations. So I found a new way to, to work on textiles by working with a textile artist. And she'd never worked with cyanotype before, and I'd never worked with silk and wool before. And together we made this new thing that nobody had made before, and that was lots of fun. Um, and I started working with um, philosophers and people who live with dementia, and getting their ideas about their life and what it was like to live with dementia, and what they thought about memory, and this gave me. Uh, a whole set of ideas about how I could give a voice to their issues and try and take me away and just find art that, that helps people understand dementia in the way that they had to live with dementia. Yeah. And I found that really satisfying. Um, and then the philosophers, I've been working with them for about three years and, um, and they were really encouraging. They they listened to my ideas as a, as a non-academic philosopher and they encouraged me to write them down philosophically so I got to publish academic um, papers, academic journals about um, ideas of philosophy of memory based on what I'd done in art and that was really, you know, it was really encouraging to be, um, to be valued by somebody outside your field and, uh, and we still work together and, I, I talk to them a lot about ideas. And hopefully, there's more to come from that. Um, so the next question is: What is your personal highlight during your whole journey working as an artist? Um, so there have been a few. As I said, getting a paper published in philosophy is um, something really unexpected. Um, but I think the highlight, the thing that's made me happiest and brought me the most joy has been working with the people who've been living with dementia and them being uh, thrilled with the work that I made to support them and I made a, a big piece a five meter long quilt um, that was that was covered in um, the phrases that they'd said about how they feel about dementia and how it is to live their life uh, and it's basically like a mural. Right? Yeah, yeah. And they've, they've taken this and they show it at, um, uh, at public events. Um, they've been to conferences and shown this, this work. And I think it's even been on TV. Um, but for them to, to feel like I'd given their voice a proper, um, a proper showing, then that was, that was really special. And uh, when do you feel most productive? Um, probably just when I should be starting to do something else. <laughs> There's always that time, so yeah, you think I've just got to carry on and, and uh, I, I look after my kids at the same time and um, you know, maybe I need to give them a lesson or I've got to do the shopping, or, but there's always I just need to finish this piece or I just need to finish writing this idea down. So yeah, when, when I should be doing something else is probably when I feel the most productive. I think there's there's a lot to be said for a deadline. And if the deadline is like I have to make the food for the family or you know the, 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 the grant application has to be in by this day, then the last day or the last few hours before the deadline is the most productive. What inspires you most? Um, 
I think you get a lot of a lot of inspiration from from other people and their passions. So, like the textile artist and seeing all the things that she was doing, um, gave me a lot of ideas. And the way that she worked with with natural materials and brought in the ideas of the place where she lived into her work gave me new ideas for how I could make images with science. Um, thinking about memory and um, dementia and having to try and find ways to remember things. So everybody who lives with dementia has, has, has worked out ways to remember what's in the cupboard or what do I have to do tomorrow. And thinking about that led me to a project where I put technology inside an origami cyanotype and let them record things via this object and then the object itself became a picture. So I was inspired by other people and, and interacting with other people a lot. Do you have a vision or a goal you are working towards, both professionally and in your life? Um, I think I think I'm really lucky that I feel my artistic life is my life. Um, it mixes very well. I've managed to make it work with the family, and I feel very lucky that, that I've been able to do that. Um, so the goal, I feel like the best things have come as surprises. So. I don't really have any goals. I think the main goal would be to try and carry on making it work as best as I can um, around the family and around the, the rest of the life that I have. If I can keep fitting the art into there for as long as possible, then that's that's a great goal to, to reach. I agree. <laughs> and for you personally, what is a life well lived? I think it goes a little bit, it's a continuation of what you were saying already. Right? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's, it's uh, for me, my life well lived is, is being able to share it with people who either understand me or understand the work that I'm doing or, um, or enjoy being together whether it's through the collaborations or hopefully my family but, um, yeah the people I've got to work with um, that feels like a life well lived I've had some jobs that have made me um, miserable and we've worked very hard as a family to get out of those situations um, and get to the place where we feel as, as happy as we can in, with with as little as possible <laughs> so yeah I think that's 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 good enough it doesn't have to be perfect it just mm -hmm. has to be nothing good is perfect <laughs> yeah. so let's see what you brought with you okay so um about 175 years ago the first cyanotypes were made of natural objects. They were made of pictures of leaves and ferns and um, we still make those today. So this is um, a cyanotype on a, on a cotton bag of some leaves. Um, this is one of um, leaves again of a process that I kind of developed um, of, of leaving the cyanotypes in the sun for a very long time. So this was in the sun for about a week. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you can change the color and instead of getting a blue cyanotype, you get a more greeny, goldy, brown sand. And the, I enjoyed that. The blue color. is the characteristic color, right? Yeah, so... It's that one, So, if, oops, if you, if you expose for, mm -hmm. say, five or 10 minutes, you'll get this beautiful blue exposed for five or ten days you'll get this kind of goldy brown and I'm sure there's some uh, chemistry behind it but I, I don't understand the chemistry. 
But it's like driving a car. You don't need to know how the engine works as long as you get the results that you want. Exactly. Um, and then a few years ago, I uh, started making origami. So my, my kids got an origami book for Christmas. And after one day, they were like, oh, Dad, can you make this? And I, and I really liked origami straight away. And then realized that I could combine it with cyanotype. And so the paper is coated with the chemicals and then made into an origami. And you can leave this in the sun. And then when you open it up, you get a picture of, of what the thing was while it was an origami. So if I undo this one, i show you. So this origami crane, very classical Japanese model. And when you open it up, wow. you get a picture like this. Yeah. And I really, really found this transformation fascinating. And it, it came into the philosophy. Um, so I did a paper about whether a photograph is a memory. Mm -hmm. Because we're always told um, that photographs are saving our memories. And philosophically speaking, a traditional photograph is not a memory. It's a mnemonic that helps us remember things, mm -hmm. but it's not a memory. But this kind of image, um, philosophically, is a literal memory. So this is the memory of the experience the paper had when it was an origami crane. Mm -hmm. So if it was exposed for longer or shorter or in a different place, get a different picture, a different memory. And I really like that kind of intellectual idea around. And you can Amazing. do all kinds of things with the origami. So this again is another origami. This was a tessellation, so lots of um, uh, hexagons, all one on top of each, one top of each other. Nice. And you can get these beautiful um, uh, geometric patterns. And the last thing um, that I'll show is, this is something that I made with a textile artist. So this is a mixture of um, silk and wool, and it was intended to um, to look a little, or to remind people of, um, say, a, a nice white sandy beach with um, sky and sea and waves and clouds. And we use the sand attack technique to make this. And it looks great as a hanging, but you also get to, to wear a sand attack for yeah. a change. Amazing. So um, uh, people can experience uh, all the types of sand attack in your workshop, or is it more focused on certain things? Yeah, so in the workshops, we, we do um, the works on paper. So we'll do some kind of tradi traditional things. Um, we can also make the origami thing, so if we have time we'll make a simple origami model and I can show that process. Um, and we usually do a work on fabric, whether that's a, um, a t-shirt or a tote bag. Um, uh, that's usually up to the participants, they can request if they prefer one or the other. Um, but yeah, I like to show that Cyanotype is flexible um, on different materials. Thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks.